outside of the world in itself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sakes, I say our sakes, sake. he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, say in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Do me a favor this morning. Turn to your neighbor. Tell a neighbor. Yeah. 
in your ears. Okay, okay, okay. You, you, you gotta watch those folks, especially if they whispering in your ear. Because the fact they're whispering in your ears is a sign that it's a problem, because it wasn't a problem, they speak out with it.
the love of Christ urges us on. It is the love of Christ, that same love that looked past me and called me to be a minister of the gospel. He said, it is the love of Christ that urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Now hold on, because what I found in my own understanding of this passage, as I shared this morning, is that here Paul introduces his motivating factor, which he says is the love of Christ. But Paul can't talk about the love of Christ without talking about the work of Christ. You gotta catch this. Because love is more than just telling me you love me. If you love me, you gotta show me. Love is as love does. And so immediately when he introduces Jesus' or rather Christ's love, he follows that up by talking about what Christ did. He said he died for all. Christ died for all. And because he died for all, you gotta understand this, he said also he lives for all. That if I die with him, as Paul says here, that when he dies, therefore all have died. When he then is risen, all what? Live. Now you gotta follow this. So that Christ loves us, that's Paul's motivation. And Christ's love is manifested by what Christ does, which Paul says Christ died, and he died for all. Now what Paul then would suggest is that since Christ has died for all, and not only died for all, but risen for all, something radical has taken place. Can I, can I teach this for a quick second? He said this, you want to, he said, if Christ has died for all, and we have all died with him, that is his crucifixion, then in his resurrection we all live with him, that is the power of God. Now, he says, if Christ has died and Christ is risen, that means that all of reality has been transformed because of what Christ has done. Are you working with me? That if Christ dying and resurrection means that sin no longer has dominion over us, but now we have the possibility of eternal life in Him, that means that our whole reality then is transformed. Because after all, being a Christian is nothing more than perspective. That, that means that if we believe what Paul says, that our way of looking at the world must change. Now, I know somebody here. You can't look at the world as it is and be satisfied or think that that is it if you have Christ in your life. Because if you have Christ in your life, you know that all things really don't matter at that point, that God can transform all things. Are you working with me? Let me know what I'm saying is, if on Friday it looked like he died, that if Friday was all we knew, it would have been a wrap. But then somebody said on Sunday morning, come on, he rose. That means that when they saw death, on Sunday they saw life. What they thought was death, now was risen in life. What they thought the world looked like on Friday, looked radically different on Sunday. In other words, if you are in Christ and believe in Christ, it does not matter what things might look like, because it ain't over until the power of God begins to work and move on your own behalf. Well, I want to talk to somebody here this morning, because too often we want to hear how we fix the pain away, he keeps the work it out. But I don't need to help you understand why this is the case. He's a fix. Meant that the world away was dead. His resurrection meant now he was rising in new power. And not only new power, but new life. Watch what Paul says. He says, because of that, from now on, we cannot live for ourselves. But for him who died and was raised for us. I want you to understand that. He says, in other words, if you believe this and are part of this fellowship of believers, you no longer live for yourself. That's the first result of this radical change. That you no longer live for yourself. You no longer live for yourself. Let's back up. It ain't about you no more. It's about what God wants to do with your life in order to get in glory. You no longer live for yourself. You cannot convince me that you are a born again believer in what God has done through Jesus Christ and you are fixated and intoxicated with your own self. It don't work that way. If you are one who believes in what Jesus Christ has done for you, you realize that you must now live your life as a 
part of ourselves and not God. He said the first result of this radical change of reality that happens because of Christ uh, dying and rising, one is that we no longer live for ourselves. And then secondly, look what he says down there in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we want to do Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. Hold on. So now what Paul is not introducing is something different now. He said that not only do we no longer live for ourselves, but we can't view reality from our old lenses. I want to ask this. In other words, the way I see reality now must change. One of the biggest tricks I think about the world operates is that it gets us to believe that the way of the people of God ought to be a mirror of the way of culture. That in of itself is insane. Because the Jesus movement was never a movement that sought affirmation from the powers that be. The Jesus movement was a movement that ran countercultural to the way that the culture was moving. You see, I gotta say this because many of us think that being a Christian is being accepted by the world. Oh, better up. No. He, he said, you always want to have problems if you're coming in my name. If they don't understand me, they sure ain't gonna understand you.
He says that all of this, that most of the cancer has come from God. All of this, this newness, this transformed reality, this transformed viewpoint, he said it comes from God who was trying to reconcile us to God. I love how Paul is doing this. He's switching up now. He says that God was reconciling us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You've got to get this. That God, our says, did for us through Jesus Christ what only God could do. In other words, um, there was nothing that you could do that would have guaranteed what God did. Oh, I gotta get to this. Um, in other words, in other words, I know you're holy, but you ain't holy enough to make God send Jesus.
if you're not accepting your place in Him, you're not living a full life. There's something missing. There's something missing. There's something missing. If your life is not being lived in Him, experienced in Him, there's something missing today. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You've lived life for so many people, but you haven't lived for Him or in Him. The truth about it is that life will begin to lose meaning if you base it on yourself. Because at the end of the day, we will pass through this place. But life gains its violence from accepting our place in Him. In Him. He's the creator. We're the creature. Your life has been a reflection of your inconsistency. Your inconsistency and your inability to be still in any place. And other people have not you for being inconsistent and, 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 and unstable. But I want to let you know your instability has been because you have not recognized the place you're really in. It's in Christ. In Christ. And so today, we offer Christ to you, my brother, my sister. No matter where you are, no matter where you are. When I say where you are, I don't mean your location, the sanctuary. I mean spiritually where you are. Emotionally, where you are. Because some of us can be in this place right now, but emotionally far, far away. Completely distant and disconnected. If you're here today, you do not know Jesus. Christ, your personal Lord, Savior, the Lord, and the Redeemer. We offer Christ to you, my brother. Those that you say, we offer Christ to you, my sister. If you're here today, won't you come? If he's speaking to you right now, won't you come? Because now the Bible says if one sinner comes to me, angels in heaven rejoice. So this is the most sacred time in our church. And I would ask you to stand with us, okay? And put the camera down for me. Because we don't want to be in the church We go to the sanctuary. The church. Okay. 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 Okay.